pleased to present Austin Faith Dialogue, brought to you by the Austin Metropolitan Ministries. In the weeks ahead, you will see these and other programs by various denominations. Where can a family receive quality health care when they have no insurance and little money for a doctor? The People's Community Clinic, our topic for the edition of Austin Faith Dialogue, speaks to that need. Stay with us. This is Austin Faith Dialogue, a public affairs program discussing the important crossroad of religion in life, produced by Austin Metropolitan Ministries in cooperation with KTBC-TV. Austin Faith Dialogue highlights the interaction of the religious community with the social and cultural issues throughout our area. Now, today's edition of Austin Faith Dialogue. Richard Thompson, pastor of Central Presbyterian Church, and your host for this edition of Austin Faith Dialogue. The People's Community Clinic here in Austin serves the health care needs of more than 12,500 low-income adults and children each year. With more than 140,000 people in Travis County currently uninsured and not able to pay for basic health care, People's Community Clinic is a welcome relief for those services such as prenatal care, adult and pediatric and primary care, HIV testing and counseling and lab services. With me now in the studio is Rosanna Seelock who is the executive director of People's Community Clinic. And Rosanna, we're glad to have you with us this morning. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. And would like to also have you just give us a, a quick look at what People's uh, Community Clinic is, the extent of its services. Uh, we're a primary care health center and uh, we provide a full range of primary care services. And as you mentioned, it's prenatal care, adult and pediatric uh, general medicine, which is your general family doctor medicine, um, family planning, women's health, HIV counseling and testing, prenatal care, health education. Um, we are currently doing outreach um, with immunizations and uh, HIV testing. Um, we're focusing a, a lot of services in outreaching adolescents. Uh, we also have a nutrition counseling and we have a support group for women who are HIV positive. Well, you do a lot. We do, we do a lot, <laughs> yes. Yes, we do. And uh, as you mentioned those range of services, it makes me wonder now, I, I thought Brackenridge offered this kind of service to the public uh, as a city agency. Brackenridge does, and Brackenridge um, offers tertiary care, which is hospital care. Um, and so and we offer primary care, which is that entry into, into the health care system. Oh. Um, Brackenridge also, um, being a hospital, has a different emphasis and focus. Um, people are a, a good deal sicker when they get to Brackenridge, so we're the first, we're the first level of health care, um, early intervention, prevention, it's all part of primary care. Mm -hmm. And in the introduction, <clears throat> we had occasion to note that you're addressing yourself to the needs primarily of uninsured and low income. Right. It's not just indigent folks that you're working with. Right. Um, it, it's very interesting because what we see is a whole lot of, um, lot of folks fall between the cracks. They um, don't have insurance. Perhaps they're working, but they have low-income jobs. They can't afford to have um, the dollars taken out of their take-home pay to pay for insurance. Uh, or they are working at places that don't provide insurance. Mm -hmm. Or they're hourly wage workers that don't meet the hourly requirements to qualify them for health insurance. And you're supported by uh, who, who provides your money? A real patchwork, um, real patchwork of funding. Um, uh, the city of Austin provides partial funding for the adult and pediatric general medicine day programs. Um, St. David's Hospital funds the evening programs of, of general medicine. Um, the city and county fund a portion of prenatal care. We are a Medicaid provider. Title 10, which is federal money that comes through the state, funds women's health and HIV counseling and testing. Title 20, which is a combination of state and federal funds, um, provide um, extra funding for women's health programs. We also have grants from uh, foundations. Um, we, we're a recipient of some of the CGA golf money, which provides funding for some adolescent health services, um, and various um, donations, public support, community support, and then fees from patients. Okay, well, I was just mentally making a, a, a list of how many sources you have, and it came up with about seven different... Seven, uh, s seven different sources, and from some of those sources, 
three different streams of funding, so we end up with probably about 11 different sources. Mm -hmm. So you're actually a nonprofit, private That's right. corporation. That's exactly right. And, uh, but that you relate to these different folks, so you have a lot of people to be accountable to. Yes, we sure do. Right? We sure do. Well, I think that um, we're, in just a minute, we're going to have a, a, a video that gives an overall uh -huh. view of this. But uh, I think it would be helpful to know how long have, has the clinic been going? The clinic has been around, in fact, next year will be the clinic's 25th anniversary. Um, we were, um, we started in the basement of the Congregational Church oh. right off the drag. And so mm -hmm. we talk about, about um, the kinds of partnerships that um, uh, communities of faith form with the larger community. We're a prime example of that. Uh, we only moved out of those quarters because we had woefully outgrown them four years ago. But I must say that without the support of the Congregational Church, People's Community Clinic just wouldn't have mm -hmm. existed. Good. Well, in the, the second half of the show, we'll come back to the relationships uh -huh. you have with the religious community. Uh -huh. But from the, the start, you've, you've had that Right from the beginning, that's mm -hmm. right. Um, and how long have you been with the clinic? I've been with the clinic for nine years. Uh -huh. uh, it's been a very gratifying experience. I've watched it grow. Um, and I suppose the most gratifying is, number one, the work, and number two, the staff. When you work in this field, you have the good fortune of, of uh, working alongside a lot of wonderful people that share a sense of the same values. Mm -hmm. we, um, we're going to um, have a chance to look at where you work and what this uh, program is involved in in a, in a visual way with a, a video clip now. And uh, after that, we'll be coming right back uh, following a break and uh, continuing our discussion about the Community People's Clinic. People's Community Clinic sees close to uh, between 20 and 24,000 people a year, uh, patient visits. Uh, we've seen this number increasing uh, in the three years that I've been here. Uh, the the uh, number of people who can afford insurance is dropping. The number of people who fall uh, in the category where they're not eligible, there, there's no insurance provided for them, is greatly increasing in this county. Uh, I've heard of days when 50 to 100 people were turned away at the desk for appointments. That, of course, uh, stresses our clinic because it takes time to even uh, tell a person that there's no space for them and that uh, even that time could be used for uh, patient-oriented activity. They uh, obviously take care of people who otherwise wouldn't get care or at least would be thrown in uh, to a uh, system that, that uh, wouldn't, wouldn't satisfy them. Well, I think that if, if the People's Clinic wasn't there, uh, what you would find is that the places where, or a place where somebody could go to get good quality health care would not exist, and their access to, um, to see a physician would not be there. And so they would go to where they would have to, uh, to go to get care, and that would be the emergency rooms. The costs of care after uh, catastrophe are far higher, as we all know, than the costs of prevention. So the whole town will pay more for neglecting health at the level addressed by the clinic and that's a cost I don't want us to pay. Health education is um, part of um, the overall service provided to patients who, who come to People's Community Clinic but it's not just a one part of the service. It, it really makes up the part of the, the philosophy that we hold um, for the clients and that is to to prepare them for um, a healthy, better life. Uh, research supports that if people can stay well and healthy, it's, it's a lot less expensive to provide root, um, annual physical checkups as opposed to treatment illness, and, and uh, especially if that illness happens to be a long-term chronic illness. If they don't have funds to pay for a, a simple annual physical, they certainly don't have the funds to maintain a chronic illness. Peoples assists many uh, very high-risk mothers to have good birth outcomes. We are trying to prevent low birth weight. We're trying to 
achieve a fully uh, developed child, uh, one who is full term and without developmental delays or disabilities uh, at birth. Then once the baby is born, the EPSDT screenings, the pediatric well-child checkups are all absolutely essential. People often assist those children with continuing care during their first few years. Certainly nothing goes any further to uh, ensure a good outcome both for the mother and the child than early and careful prenatal care. Okay, so we're on the home stretch now with your pregnancy. And this is the point where we'll start seeing you every week. Okay, sometimes you have the baby. You may please ask for what you're going to do about the baby's medical care after the baby. Part of our prenatal education uh, actually is an emphasis to the expectant parent about the need for preventive health care, uh, including well child checkups and immunizations uh, for their newborns. The clinic has uh, capacity to see around 100 patients a day. Uh, this patient is a mix of people that are here for. Uh, health maintenance types of activities that would be family planning, uh, 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 prenatal care. Uh, we also have a, a fairly a real large component of, of uh, general medical care for adults and uh, a growing uh, activity in the area of pediatrics. People sometimes ask me what makes People's Community Clinic different and without hesitation I'd have to say the staff. I found the medical personnel there, uh, the people of non-medical professions, all the people that work at People's Clinic are dedicated to make certain that the people that receive their health care there are receiving the same quality or very high quality health care uh, that's available in the other facilities throughout our city. A nice mixture of professionalism and warmth, real concern with the individuals. And I watched some mothers bring in what had been premature babies and the pride of the mother was matched by the delight of the people who had seen this child at an earlier stage. Um, people that have a, a, this, this deep belief um, in their neighbor, this deep belief in a sense of community, a, a, a real strong feeling that I can make a difference. But they're crowded. And I believe uh, the plan is to move administration out of the main clinic building, and I think that would be super, and they could use it to great advantage. Currently, we have our manager of health education um, that operates out of the kitchen one afternoon each week because we have an increase in our HIV counseling services on that afternoon. We are now going to take a break, and when we return, we'll have more discussion with Rosanna Seeluck, uh, Executive Director of the People's Community Clinic. Stay with us. Serving Austin means serving you. That has always been the primary goal of Austin Metropolitan Ministries. We are religion in action through the work of these organizations. Each plays a key role in making the capital city a better place to live, but we can't do it alone. Do you have some spare time, talents? or any resources that you can share? If you do, please call AMM at 472-7627 because serving Austin means serving you. back with Rosanna Seelock and our topic of the People's Community Clinic here in Austin. And uh, before the break, uh, it occurred to me as we were watching that videotape, it would be helpful to know exactly where in the city you're located. We're very centrally located. We're on the east access road of IH-35 at the corner of 30th. So the address is 2909 North IH-35. We're right across the expressway on the east side of 35 across from St. David's. Okay. And um, uh, I will also show a number before the end of the show in terms of uh, how folks can get a hold of you by, by phone. Yeah. But I'd like to go back to this uh, question of the church relationship. Uh, as uh, an ecumenical body here in town, Austin Metropolitan Ministries is always interested in where public services 
interconnect with uh, Protestant, Catholic, Jewish, people right. of other faith traditions. Tell us what the, some of those connections are. Some of the connections are, for, well, first of all, as I mentioned earlier, um, the, the clinic had terrific support from the Congregational Church. Um, the, the church gave over its its uh, its whole basement area, so that meant that the church had to have their suppers and their activities in another area, and that was a terrifically generous donation. That went on for 20 years, mm. uh, so it, the clinic wouldn't be here but for that help. So that was a major help. Another another a linkage that's much more current is that we um, we're working supportively with Austin Interfaith. Uh, we are going to be providing physical exams to the young people that are enrolled in the summer work program um, that's a collaboration between Austin Interfaith and Travis County. I see. And uh, another interfaith ecumenical organization is uh, working with you through the schools in that way. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Okay. Well, I think that uh, one of the things, too, is that we have the sense of our a uh, community like I'm sure any major metropolitan area in the United States has uh, just more problems than we seem to be able to keep up with. What, what's your reading on comparatively how Austin is doing in terms of providing health care for people that are low income or uninsured? You know, uh, Richard, when we see that there are 140,000 uninsured and, and we know that we are turning away um, sometimes up to 50 people a day because we have no appointments available. Yet comparatively, there are many more resources for health care available here in Austin than in many other cities, mm -hmm. which gives, gives you a notion of the magnitude of the health care crises in this country. Mm -hmm. We're doing better, but we're still far behind. We're, way f we're far behind, um, and, and the evidence is in not only the numbers that we turn away, but also uh, in the acuity um, or the degree of severity of the illness of people that are coming. They defer obtaining care because they don't have insurance, so oftentimes by the time they, they come to the clinic, um, they're pretty sick, and, they're, uh, and oftentimes these are illnesses that could have been addressed much more effectively earlier on. As, as preventative uh, health care, is, I guess it's the same principle as with any kind of ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, as you see that actually being the case in healthcare. Right, and, and part of prevention also is early intervention, so that there is the prevention through education and lifestyle change, and there is, um, there is prevention through inoculation and immunizations and um, prevention through early prenatal care, but it also, prevention, another form of prevention is access to primary care so that you can address illnesses at the earliest stage. Mm -hmm. I, I was struck too by the emphasis that you have on programs with youth, uh, adolescents. Yes. And having read somewhere that Austin has uh, the highest uh, rate of uh, of, of unwed mothers, uh, 15, teenage pregnant. Fifteen pregnant. and under. Uh-huh. Uh, in the right. nation? Yes, yes. Isn't that incredible? That's incredible. <laughs> that's, it, that is really incredible, and I think that, um, that that's the place that we have to really talk prevention. Mm -hmm. uh, and prevention is a whole range of, uh, a whole range, and from my viewpoint, is a, requires a whole range of strategies. Mm -hmm. And some of those are, are giving those young people a future, mm -hmm. um, options for um, continuation in, in jobs and in school or the support they need. Okay. Well, I, I'm just wondering if that's one reason that you, you put such an emphasis on that uh, we, teen work. We put a, a great emphasis on teen work. That's one of the reasons. Another reason is that adolescents, um, contrary to what, what the general belief is, adolescents are really underserved as a group, particularly low-income adolescents. Well, what about school health services? A school, um, there are no school health services. Um, unfortunately, um, th that's not a part that we have school nurses that are doing a tremendous job um, but essentially they act as referral agents out into the community mm -hmm. so we don't have any school-based clinics um, we don't have any um, direct service delivery in the schools I know there's a pilot now in in South Austin um, I believe next year perhaps a nurse practitioner will be in one of the middle schools but but that's the extent of school health care well, judging by the needs of the youth and the community as a whole, uh, I, I think one question that would be of help for our viewers is to know where you would like to see the People's Community Clinic be uh, five, ten years from now. 
five or ten years from now, maybe a little bit sooner, um, I would like for the, the clinic um, to uh, have satellites out in the community to be very responsive to take services where the needs are. Um, five or ten years from now, I would like to see us involved in um, some school-linked programs, perhaps in a satellite not, uh, located in an area close to um, a high school so that we could serve an entire community. I would like to look towards uh, some um, mobile units that would go out into um, uh, rural or semi-rural areas of the county um, to bring some health services. Uh, that's what I see. I see us having our central location, but I would also envision that we would begin to move more in the direction of taking services to where the people are. Mm -hmm. And you know, as you think about expanding and having satellites and more services, I want to ask you a very direct and candid question. Yes. Isn't it still just a drop in the bucket? I mean, you look at that need, and is there anything short of some kind of national policy? I mean, with all this debate on health care and all the millions that are uninsured, That's isn't right. it going to take some kind of fundamental reform at that level? Without a doubt, because this is, number one, not only a, a drop in the bucket in terms of primary care, but we haven't even gone into what happens when someone comes to our clinic and we provide primary care, but we find they need a specialist. There's no funding. Our practitioners get on the phone, our physicians, and they call in the private sector medical community and say, can you do me a favor? Can you see this person? Uh, but Pro we, bono. Pro bono. Mm -hmm. um, we're talking about people that are from out of county come in with a serious ailment. We can't even get them into Brackenridge Hospital because they're... so. Definitely, without a doubt, this is, um, we're, we're, sometimes we're practicing what is, I would consider, near third world medicine. I see. Well, give me a sense of what you would envision to be realistic in the way of reform that's doable, that moves in the direction of more complete if you were making a prediction or... If I were making a prediction, and, and again, if my perspective, of course, is, um, is, is not necessarily accurate, but I would see probably um, from where we are right now, probably an expansion of Medicare and Medicaid, probably some mandates to larger employers um, so that we would have a narrowing of that gap of uninsured if Medicaid and Medicare were expanded to cover people a little above poverty, um, and if larger employers were mandated to provide insurance, we would narrow that gap. Mm -hmm. But that would still leave a whole lot of folks that were uninsured and not covered. So it would not really be universal? It wouldn't be universal. And I think um, my, my feeling is um, that universal coverage is not something that's going to happen um, tomorrow. It's going to probably be phased in. Mm -hmm. um, uh, unless, of course, uh, you know, all the signs are, uh, that, that I look at are wrong, but I believe it's probably going to be phased in. In other words, the realities of our, where our society is today and where the, the, the power of the various respective political groups is, is that it, it will have to be almost incremental. That's right. That's mm -hmm. exactly right, Richard. But at least going in that direction. And we're talking about it. You know, f three years ago, no one was talking about the health care crises. Mm -hmm. Seriously. Three years ago, the, uh, the American public had very little information and couldn't even dialogue on it. So one of the good things about it is that, that we as a nation are starting to talk about health care right. and starting to define what our needs are. Well, you know, I think that's, that's healthy in itself. Yes. Yes. And um, I had a friend who was once uh, worked in the area of epidemiology. Yes. And he became my friend after he defined what that word was. <laughs> and it, it's been a very helpful concept from my standpoint, and both philosophically and theologically. Yes. That it has to do with the whole environment. That's of right. A, that it, what, a given individual can't be healthy or sick just in isolation, but right. in relation to. So I'm, I'm wondering from the standpoint of your work, whether you see a... Um, you're contributing not just to meeting this need and that need in individual cases, but somehow affecting the whole system and that whole environment. Uh, do, do you have any sense of that? <clears throat> I, <clears throat> I have a sense that we're affecting the whole environment, first of all, because um, we advocate, um, we, we educate, uh, we share information with the larger community on some of those issues. Um, in a, in a more spiritual way, some of the explicit values of the organization, I feel, have a spillover effect. 
and um, the va those are the values on which the organization was grounded back in 1970, and, well, and those were the um, the importance of each individual. Mm -hmm. um, that each individual walking through that door um, must be treated with dignity and respect. That you must create a healing environment. Um, that people walking through the door are people first, and an ill <laughs> they have an illness second. But number one, you must look at the person. So it's that holistic view that we espouse and that we work um, to make happen in the community by trying to link services and acting as a bridge between agencies. Mm -hmm. So uh, I would presume, though, that every health organization would have those same uh, moral, spiritual principles of treating people with respect and as individuals and so on. I guess the, the what would make your approach different in that regard? Um, because it's an in, it's explicit. Um, we 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 look at that. Um, we we don't just have it as an implicit understood value. Okay. It's right out there up front. How are we doing in terms? Because that's part of what we consider to be a healing environment because we consider patient empowerment number one. We feel that when you can empower the individual, you have helped their well-being and their wellness. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes patients have been the passive recipients of medical care, not the active participants I in see. health. So to energize them and, and enable them to That's right. be their own health care provider in that regard. Uh, yes, yeah, and to maintain their wellness and to be very proactive in, in maintaining wellness or achieving health. Uh, without uh, disclosing any confidences of individual names or circumstances, can, could you just think something uh, uh, comes to mind about people that you know have been helped and the kind of difference that's made in a case or two? <clears throat> well, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, first of all, I can tell you um, that, that generally we do, we do a patient satisfaction survey um, in, in depth twice a year. We get the comments back, and we don't ask for names, and we say, thank you for being there. You've made such a difference. I'll give you another example. Um, we charge on a sliding scale. No one's turned away for lack of ability to pay, um, we, and so we provide medication. But we will get, um, we will get people that send $2 a month saying, thank you, you mm. were, that you were there mm. for me. Um, a couple of other instances. And these are instances where people came very close to, uh, to um, serious illness. Could you give us one very quick instance? Uh, one very quick instance. A 34-year-old young man who'd lost his job walked in the door um, needing to see a physician. Um, he had been treating bronchitis at home. We had to call EMS because he had, had severe pneumonia. If we hadn't been there, it's very, it, it's very likely something more serious could have happened. I see. And uh, seriously, we need to put up the number of your clinic for people to call. Could you just uh, repeat that for us? Uh, the number is 478-4939. Well, we would like to uh, thank you for having been here, Rosanna. Thank you, Richard. It's been and, a pleasure. And uh, hope that you have some response to our discussion. And uh, we're just about out of time, and we'd like to ask you folks to be with us again next week on Austin Faith Dialogue. Our new time is at 630 on uh, KTBC, and we'll look forward to seeing you then. Peace be with you. Call Austin Metropolitan Ministries at 4.